Still four more big wins to get. It was a closeout opportunity. Paul George was tremendous in game five, which forced this one. The Suns early on, aggressive. That was the big word as Tim Legler was talking about as we were watching this game and he was keeping his notes. Mikael Bridges up top. Chris Paul had been miserable shooting it from beyond the arc, but he was hot. Jay Crowder too. The Suns were 17 to 22 off passes in the first half, 17 assists. They led by nine. Jay Crowder, big game. He hits from deep and has a little something to say to the front row crowd. Then it's Devin Booker attacking the rim. Ty Lue, give him a ton of credit. You lose one of the best players in the world and your guys close out the one seed and force this to six games. Down by 13, make it 10. The three hit by Marcus Moore Sr. Fans trying to keep in it. Batum, corner three off a good pass, had to have it, they got it. We've seen this Clipper team go on bursts. Whoa, whoa, whoa! What are we doing? Quick 10 nothing run and it was a seven point game, but then Chris Paul, just spectacular. He answers once, now in Batum. Again, Paul had not shot it well in this series from three, but was just locked in in this one. He scored or assisted on 16 of the 31 in the third, and they've got a big lead and is only going to grow. Paul on the drive. Again, Paul on the drive, and here it's just the okie doke. You understand Morris thinks he's looking towards the corner. Boogie's looking for somebody else. What are we doing? And it is a big lead, step back, and all three of these. The and one, the Suns up 19 after the free throw. And with Phoenix getting three more from Paul, as he walks by Patrick Beverly, whatever it is he said, you just cannot do that. Patrick Beverly shoves Paul in the back, giving a technical, he heads to the locker room. Paul with 31 in the second half. Now Booker burying that one. Paul George being acknowledged for what he gave this Clipper team. Again, Kawhi obviously out. And Chris Paul to the roars of his family. And the Suns fans in the building in an emotional moment is Smith and Michael Wilbon to the show. And uh, gentlemen, I, I'll begin with Chris Paul. I, I feel it's only appropriate. And Michael, how best to frame what it is that he provided this group? They had never been in the playoffs as constructed, and he obviously helps lead them. How do you frame what you saw from him in this evening? Scott, I got to go back to the beginning of it when he first knew he was going to be traded, and it's know how. Um, it's poise, it's intellect, it's toughness, um, all of those things. There's so many more, but I, I think at least those few sort of represent all that Chris Paul is. And he really wanted to come here, um, come to here, meaning, meaning Phoenix, of course. Yeah. And I, I, I probably shouldn't tell this story. I'm going to tell it quickly because it's an off-the-record story. If Chris gets mad at me later, we'll, we'll, I'll put some money in a, in a, in a little jar. It's right. fine. You know, we're, we're working it's on fine. a project, a Chris, a Chris Paul-generated project. And so we're doing it on Zooms in the, in, the, in the summer and in the early fall. And during one of the Zooms at the end, uh, Chris says, what are you going to do now? We're done. I go, I don't know. I'll go out and hit some golf balls. He says, nah, I, I need a favor. I said, what? He goes, can you help me look for a house in Scottsdale? I'm like, why would a guy who's in, already in L.A. with his family need a house in Scottsdale? And I said that, and he just pauses and he says, think, Mike, think. <laughs> and I said, I, I, it took me a while, and I went, oh, my God, this could, this could happen. And what he talked about down there is the order that he talked about it. I mean, Booker, there were all those people involved, but Devin Booker was the big, 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 big part. He, like the late, great Kobe Bryant, looked at Devin Booker very early on, and they both, they each, saw something that drew them. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they liked, loved everything about him. And so Chris wanted to play with Devin Booker, and he thought this could work. He thought it could work before anybody else thought it could work, other than maybe Devin. And so, but all of those things characterized 
the way Chris felt about coming to the Phoenix Suns at the beginning of the season. You know, Mike Wilbon isn't the only one with an off-the-court story about Chris Paul. As you well know, <laughs> Scott, Michael Wilbon, our executive produced a project, Why Not Us, with Chris Paul for ESPN Plus earlier this year. And a lot of times we found ourselves talking off the record about what he felt about Devin Booker. And let me tell you something about Chris Paul. He's not well liked by a few people in the NBA because he's in a quiet taste, Scott. He's okay. a guy that gets in your face, in your mug. He's incredibly demanding. He pulls no punches. He holds you accountable. That ain't for everybody, but here's what you need to know about him. As much as he's not liked by some people, He's loved more by others and universally respected by everyone because of his leadership ability. And so when you see him with his teammates in Phoenix and you see the way that they have this level of adulation and affection for him, what that means is they've bought in. They recognized a long time ago that this guy that is in a quiet taste, if we acquire that taste, we might just be champions one day. That's the kind of talk that they were having during this season when they were one of the top two teams in the Western Conference, and it came out tonight to reach fruition. This is about the leadership of Chris Paul. A game six, a closeout game, fresh off of Paul George dropping 41. What does he do? Does he answer with 25 points and 15 assists? No. <laughs> he drops 41 Real answer. Right. with eight assists in 35 minutes with zero turnovers. I'm sorry. It is the most special performance of his career, and it happened on the same night that this man is going to the NBA Finals for the first time in his 16-year career. His greatest, I think his greatest performance, not his best performance. Yes, his guy, greatest. But his greatest performance coming here, getting him to the Finals, fulfilling all of this. And, it, and he stresses over it now. Don't, don't be misled. I mean, he wanted this, wants Bad. this badly. And so for it all, to, for him to make this happen here, and as Booker said, I asked Booker once, what is it like now that you got to be accountable to this guy? And he smiled, and Booker said, it ain't for everybody. <laughs> right. And, and to, and to you, Stephen and you guys, I mean, he's a demanding dude. And you guys both well know that that, that whole disrespect or, or, you know, chip on the shoulder thing can be a played out routine. But he's fueled by those who believe that his best time was behind him. And I think he demonstrated clearly tonight what he still can pos possesses. And now they have at least four more games to prove that he could be a champion, a minted champion once and for all. As always, gentlemen, your time appreciated. We'll talk again when the finals arrive, all right? All right. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. There's a yin to that yang. On the other side of the joy, there's uh, the emotions of Reggie Jackson, who visited with us. You know, what we did this year was special. Tim Legler alongside, and Tim against a team in the Clippers and a coach in Ty Lue who've shown a whole lot of fight, particularly in situations like this where they're trying to climb out of a hole. Phoenix wants no part of a Game 7 at home where all the pressure would have been on their shoulders. Their stars weren't going to let it happen. What'd they do? No, they weren't. And look, I, I said before the game, this was going to be Chris Paul's night. He, he hadn't played well. He had not shot well. Nope. He, he has capable of doing what he did tonight offensively. He and Booker were special in this one. And I like some of the wrinkles that they added in this game. And here's one of them. And this is so unique. This is the kind of treatment Steph Curry normally gets where you get the defender literally on the high side. Patrick Beverly's just trying to keep Devin Booker from coming anywhere up here to receive the basketball. So they put a little wrinkle in. You put DeAndre Ayton in the middle. So now he's going to set this screen and you're going to see Booker now flare out here. And that's going to force Patrick Beverly to come over the top. So now when Booker catches this, he's already got Patrick Beverly behind him. Love the wrinkle. Catches it. Nice little flare now as he looks up. Now it's just this little snake dribble into this 15-footer. That's his favorite spot on the floor. This little pull-up. This is an and one. This is Devin Booker cooking in the first half. But then, Scott, we talk about this run that the Clippers went on after it got cut to seven, and that's what we're looking at right here. Seven-point game. Well, how does this happen? The Clippers are in his zone. Let's take a look at exactly what happens. This is all Patrick Beverly's mistake, because right now, they're in a zone, but they're matched up everywhere on the floor. You got five guys basically matched up in your area. For some inexplicable reason, Patrick Beverly decides to run over here on this pass. Now you get two on the ball. The one thing you can never have in his own defense is two guys on the basketball because it's going to lead to a simple pitch and catch right back here. Chris Paul dribbles in for wide number three. Why did I pick this play with not a lot going on? Because this might be the most important shot of Chris Paul's career. 
They just cut it to seven, and you walk into a three, and you're ready for the moment you knock it down. And then here, another little wrinkle. Double screen. You get the first one here, the second one here. Chris Paul comes off, and really what he's trying to do is engage Boogie Cousins. This is the guy they want to attack. Don't see the second screen coming. He comes off. Cousins is reluctant to help because Aiton's here for the lob. So Boogie kind of stays flat-footed. And now Chris Paul is able to turn the corner, get to the rim. All this during that run when he put the game away, basically single-handedly. Right. And, you know, like I said, he's not he's a reluctant scorer. But when you get opportunities on big stages, big moments, he knows, look, I got a young team. I want no part of a game seven, like you said, with a bunch of young fellas going through it for the first time at home and what that might feel like. He wanted to take care of business tonight, and he did in a huge way after the Clippers made that run to make it look like it was going to get very interesting. You know me well, and, and you know how little I like the whole idea of legacy. It's what you are when you're done, in yeah. my opinion, yeah. and how the, 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 the conversation can get exhausting, frankly, about what players need to do. It's a team sport. A lot has to happen. That said, yeah. the importance for Chris Paul to now have earned the right to play the most important games of his life. How significant, given the totality of his career absent this trip and what this trip gives him the chance to now do? The guy's considered one of the greatest point guards of all time. He was before the last two seasons. But for me, these last two seasons are really now would give you a much greater appreciation than you ever had totally for Chris agree. Paul. Totally agree. And that's amazing if you think of those teams with the Clippers that right. he was on. With all that talent. And year after year, they're, in, they're running for a title contender. Mm -hmm. What he did in Oklahoma City... And what he did with this team, to take this team and lead this team to the finals with a lot of help. It's a very complete basketball team. I love watching this team play because they check every box. But for me, these are the two most significant years of his career. And to do it at this age, at what you think is like the end, the twilight's around the corner, nothing can be more impressive or more rewarding, I'm sure, to Chris Paul when he thinks about all those years. It probably all better teams in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. But now to have this moment where he is so revered as a leader, to be able to come into this group and give them that essence of floor leadership that they desperately needed and toughness, man, this is like the icing for Chris Paul right now. And it's also the perfect spot too, right? Because you got a 24-year-old superstar in Booker and you got a big fella in Aiton who, as you said, like not a lot of bigs in the game. You can stay on the floor when you're a big like that. As always, Tim, the time is so much appreciated. Thanks, Scott. We'll be talking during the finals. Oh, yeah. Can we welcome in Monty Williams now? Well, well I'll turn I'm turning around right now the Clippers and Paul George. You know, it is what it is. I came up short again. I'm proud of uh, what we did as a team. Um, I wasn't out to prove nothing to nobody, um, but to show up as a leader for this team and um, put, our, put, put us in position to um, get to where we got to. Again, came up short. Um, my good wasn't enough, um, but there's there's room for improvement, um, which is you know <clears throat> what I try to uh, continue to, to push the envelope to get better going into this summer. Um, but it's good though. I'll, I'll look back, I'll reflect, I'll see what I need to get better at, and um, address it right away uh, when it's time to start training again. George was asked to do everything for the Clippers this postseason, particularly after Kawhi Leonard went down with injury. Remember, they won two games in a row against the one seed Utah after that injury. No one played more minutes or scored more points in the playoffs thus far than George, also fourth in rebounds. Down, damn good. Damn good. Michael Wilbon knows the NBA. He was smart enough to listen to his golf clubs. He's got a place in Phoenix, so he knows the Valley, too. <laughs> Michael, as nice as Devin Booker is, this thing is Chris Paul and Monty Williams' success story. How do you see this and their impact? Well, you said it. It's, it's, it's their story. And, of course, the story can't be written without Devin Booker. Um, and probably some other interesting smaller elements after Devin. But this, this starts with Chris Paul and Monty Williams. And, uh, you know, when Chris was in Oklahoma City last year, we, we started working on a project, which is not about the season, it's about a chunk of his life. We started working on it, and I said to him, when are you gonna get out of Oklahoma City? And he said, no, 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 I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm good being here. I promised them I would be here. I'd help these young guys develop. And I know people all around the country, like I was, were saying, well, what is he doing? What is Chris Paul doing? And people thought his best basketball was gone. And then, He's patient. He comes to Phoenix. He comes to the Suns in large part because of, and I don't know what the order is, but 
Monty Williams and Devin Booker. Mm -hmm. Probably Devin Booker because you got to play with somebody. <laughs> um, and so Devin Booker was the guy like the late, great Kobe Bryant. The two of them saw something in Devin Booker. They saw a lot in Devin Booker. You know, I, 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 it, it's just, it's weird. It's a great story if you have all the backdrop and people are going to mm -hmm. develop that and they're going to talk about how these pieces fit. But it started with Chris Paul. And then it, it didn't end yet, but it reaches another high note, if you will, with Chris Paul tonight. 41 points. I haven't seen a box cool. score yet. 41 points he finished with. I think he was, I know he was seven of eight from three point shooting. It was phenomenal to watch Chris Paul given, he mentioned it, the losses, the injuries, the misfortune. I mean, he was just testing, po tested positive for COVID at a time where people who are vaccinated like he is don't even test at all. Mm -hmm. And somehow he has what one physician here in Phoenix who knows, we both know, said it's just sheer bad luck. That's all it is. But yet he missed the first two games of the conference finals. So there's been, the journey's unbelievable. This is, this is Chris Paul's night without question. Uh, people in Arizona know this. Not everybody outside of it does. But uh, Phoenix, that's the Suns town, man. They are the original pro sports franchise out there. What's the feel you get in the city? Well, it's, it's great you bring that up. And you having worked there a few years ago, you know that. Because before, there were the Cardinals, the Coyotes, the Diamondbacks. There mm -hmm. were the Suns. And Charles, this, Charles Barkley has a bunch of voiceovers, which are just great. <laughs> and it's one thing that's rally the valley, and people go wild when they hear that in Charles' own intonation. <laughs> but the other one, which I find more interesting, is Charles saying, hey, we were first. We were first. And the older fan base, and there's fewer of them, mm -hmm. they remember Paul Westfall and Alvin, other professional sports teams and leagues. And it, they're first. They are first. There's no real history of sports in the Valley other that doesn't start with the Suns. It mm -hmm. starts with the Suns. The noise in the building, you wouldn't even recognize it from your days <laughs> in Phoenix. It sounds like old Boston Garden or old Chicago Stadium. Um, it just, it's unbelievable the passion that these younger fans have for this Suns team, even though I don't know how many of them know the history of the Suns and that they were first and that they had some damn good basketball teams yeah. a long time ago that just couldn't win. Yeah, I don't know if they have the full taste of the madhouse on McDowell, but some of us do. Michael no. Wilbon, Phoenix, thank you. You're going to get some more home games to cover. That's fun. Thanks. Even at 112. Thanks <laughs> a lot. Giannis Antetokounmpo doesn't have any structural damage in his left knee after getting injured in Game 4 of the Eastern Conference Finals, according to Woj and Zach Lowe. An MRI also showed that the ligaments in his knee are sound. So... What does that mean for his status in Game 5 on Thursday? Malika Andrews has that answer. The Milwaukee Bucks are officially listing Giannis Antetokounmpo as doubtful for Thursday's Game 5 against the Atlanta Hawks. But given how much swelling is in his hyperextended left knee, I'm hearing that it would be a bit surprising to see him out on the floor playing in that game. But Mike Budenholzer did say that this was the best possible news, the best possible outcome, given how scary it was to watch him go down in the moment. And if he is unable to play, expect someone like Bobby Portis to potentially even start, but certainly step up to give them more offensive production and a little bit of a spark. And on the other side of the ball, the Atlanta Hawks have Trey Young officially listed as questionable. He is here in Milwaukee, but this continues to be about mobility and pain tolerance in that foot. So he's here continuing to get treatment, and the hope is that he's going to be available to return at some point in this series. So with all the uncertainty surrounding the star players, the betting odds for this series have shifted to nearly even at Caesars Sportsbook by William Hill. Milwaukee was minus 500 prior to game one. The Bucks are now minus 125 favorites.